Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Jacob Turnus. I'm the coordinator of student involvement and Greek life. I work down here in the Center for Student Involvement. And um, a big part of my job is making sure that student organizations have the resources and have the information that they need in order to be successful. And that's, that's what this meeting is about. This meeting, the purpose of this is to give you a brief overview of what you need to know to be a student organization and also those uh, resources that are available to you. A couple things about today's meeting. We'll go pretty quickly because I know you don't want to spend all of your time sitting here in a meeting with me. Um, and also, this year we've decided to go paperless. So in the past, if you've attended this meeting, you've gotten a folder of information. What we found is there was a lot of waste with that. People didn't keep the folders or the information was time sensitive. And so after a couple of weeks, it was no longer useful. So what we've done this year is we've created an electronic folder on TigerLink and the resources <coughs> will be available through there. So that includes this PowerPoint uh, presentation. So if you want to take notes, you can, but if realize if you see deadlines or contact information up on the screen, you can access all of that digitally after the meeting. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. You are all student organizations, so who can tell me, like, what does it take to be a student organization? Like, what are the requirements? You have to be registered on TigerLink. It's good. Very good. Faculty sponsor, faculty or staff, two officers, president and treasurer, and at least five student members. <coughs> Covered several there in one shot. Good job. What else? Aren't there service requirements? Yep, 20 hours of service every year. Okay, so you guys got a lot of them. Um, so this is the full list of requirements that you have to, to meet to be a student organization. So the first thing is that you have to have a unique name and a unique purpose. What that means is, say you're a member of the chess club and you get into a fight with the president, you can't decide to split off and start the chess and checkers club, because that's not a unique purpose from another student organization. We try to have as many student organizations as possible, but we don't want to duplicate what other groups are doing. Um, you have to have two students that are willing to serve as the officers. Those are the president and the treasurer. Each group can have additional officers, but those are the two that you have to have. And those two have to recruit at least three other student members for a grand total of five student members. As your organization grows, or if you're larger than that, um, it's okay to have additional faculty and staff and community members be involved, but you need to understand that the primary purpose of a student organization is to serve students, and so that's why we have the guideline of 80% of your membership should be student, um, student members. You have to have a faculty or staff advisor. Uh, this person needs to be a full-time uh, faculty or staff member, so it's okay to have graduate students advise, but you need to have at least one faculty or staff who's full-time that will sign off. You also need to develop a constitution and or a bylaws. So what this is, is this is the document that says how your organization is going to run. I don't care what your rules are or how you run your organization. I just care that you have it written down somewhere how you're going to run your organization. So your constitution and bylaws are like what officers you have, are you going to charge membership dues, how often do you meet, what's the process for adding members, removing members, <laughs> electing officers, all that stuff that you need to know to run your organization should be written down in that document and then you upload that to TigerLink. You do register every single year on TigerLink, so this is so we can keep an accurate record of our student organizations and we know who the current contact people are for each of those groups. Um, when you register, the president, the treasurer, and the advisor all have to sign off on the non-discrimination statement, and the, the two officers have to release their grades. Um, that's because presidents and treasurers have to maintain at least a 2.0 cumulative GPA. You have to attend one of the annual student organization meetings, so you're all here, so you've completed that aspect. And there is the expectation that your organization does 20 hours of service every year. So this is 20 hours as an organization. <coughs> so if you've got 20 members and you each do one hour, you've met that benchmark. So it's not, not too high of a standard to have to hit. So a little bit about the process. Every organization must renew every year. The deadline for returning groups to renew by is September 18th. Um, so that's gonna come up here in just a few weeks and so you need to be prepared to get through all the steps. Once you've made sure that you've met all those requirements and you have your officers elected and your faculty staff, all of that, you will submit the registration form on TigerLink. Um, after you submit that, it comes in here to the CSI. I review all the information, make sure that it's all complete. And then um, once I give it the look over, 
Brittany, our administrative assistant who sits over here, she actually sends out the notification that your application has been accepted and she will send you the links to the non-discrimination and grade release. And so then once you've submitted those two forms, you'll get a, a final email that says that you're fully approved for the, the academic year. So that's the process that everyone will go through. If anybody is in here for a new student organization, you don't have to meet the September 18th um, deadline. We want student organizations to be able to form whenever they meet those requirements. So if you're getting started up with a new group and you don't have members until September 25th or October 1st, whatever, you can still submit that registration later on. But renewing groups have to hit that deadline. So when you go in to complete your registration, you will do that on TigerLink. If you're familiar with TigerLink, you might notice that it looks different now than it did last year. Um, over the summer, Campus Labs, who manages this website, did a complete <coughs> update to it. So I think it's a little bit more streamlined, it's a little bit more user friendly, but there is a learning curve. So things might be in a different area than what you remember before. So I'm gonna try to give you some helpful tips. So when you log in, you can select the Organizations tab at the very top of the screen and that will take you to the full directory. From here, you can find your organization um, by searching through alphabetically or searching for it, whatever makes most sense to you, and you can find your organization. If you're a new group that's registering for the first time, obviously you're not listed here, and so you will register your new organization utilizing this button here on the left-hand side. So new groups will use that button. Existing groups will need to go to their organizations page so I used Alpha Gamma Delta as the example here and if you're eligible for registration which our student organizations are unless they've already submitted it you'll have a blue bar with the register button right here so that's where you need to go to register your organization because <coughs> then that will import all the information from before and make it easier for you and also make sure that you don't create a, a duplicate organization on TigerLink. Regardless of whether you're renewing or registering for the first time, you're going to pop up the application and it's going to take you to the instructions page first. There's a lot of instructions here, but I, I definitely encourage you to take the two or three minutes that it's going to require you to read these because most of the time when I deny a, a registration or a renewal, it's because whoever did the application made an error that they would have known about if they would have just read the instructions. So I'm gonna help you guys out by giving you a couple of the most common mistakes. Um, number two up here is the organization categories. This will only apply to new groups. Um, renewing groups, you've already selected this, so you don't have to worry about it. But for a new group, you have to select one category. So you can either be a campus-wide organization or a spiritual organization or a departmental organization. You can't be multiple of those things. You have to select the one that best applies to you. Um, renewing groups, that step isn't even um, accessible to you, so you don't have to worry about it. You've already selected that category in the past. The other common mistake is number five here. When you're loading new members to your organization roster, make sure you do it using their FHSU email address. Even if my preferred email address is Yahoo or Hotmail or Gmail, I still have to be loaded in here using my FHSU because that's the email address that's attached to my ID card, it's attached to my ID number, and that's how the system ties everything together. So it knows when I swipe my card, that also represents the same person whose email address is in here. So you have to use your FHSU email address whenever you list new people. If a Gmail or Yahoo is in there, your registration will be denied. So we talk about registering, like why, why it is that you register. There's a couple of like big reasons that we use. One is we want to be able to provide an accurate listing of all of our organizations to incoming students, students that are looking to get involved, transfers. Like we want to be able to tell them, yes, these organizations do in fact exist. So that's why we have you update this every single year. Another thing, there's some protection that's allotted to our organizations because they're under the umbrella of the university. So there's some oversight and there's some um, protection that's allotted to you, whereas if you're just existing kind of out on your own, you might open yourself up to some liability. In addition to those two big reasons, there's a lot of benefits that you all get for being a, a recognized student organization. Uh, you can reserve rooms, you can hold fundraisers, you can use, utilize poster route, homecoming, SGA funding. Whether you like TigerLink or not, there actually is a lot of cool features on there as far as events and um, document storage. So you can utilize all of that, and you can also send out all student emails. 
We're going to talk about how to do a few of these things kind of throughout the presentation, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it here. Uh, another thing that you need to know about, you maybe you have heard about it in the news, maybe not, but Title IX is a, is a federal law that universities have been under a lot of um, just like close watch about lately. So we want to make sure that Fort A State University and all of our organizations are open and accepting places. And if an issue happens, we want to make sure that people know how to uh, address those concerns. So this is you know, one of the policy statements about it from our, our um, Title IX coordinator, who's Dr. Keegan Nichols. But a couple of things that you need to know is that organization advisors are required to report any, um, any discrimination or harassment to Dr. Nichols. Um, so if they come across something, they're a required uh, reporter. And two, if as a student you feel like you're being harassed or discriminated against, like uh, you can go through Dr. Nichols and she can make sure the appropriate steps are taken to make sure that your concerns are addressed. So I just want to make you aware of this. We're not going to spend a ton of time discussing it because um, Title IX is a very complicated issue, but, but Dr. Keegan Nichols is the person that can, can assist with those, those questions. <coughs> So rather than listening to me talk the entire time, I've got a few uh, guest speakers that are gonna come in and kind of talk about some of the services that are available to you. Uh, the first one we have is Student Government Association. It's gonna come talk about allocations, appropriations, and equipment funding. Molly, take it away. All right, hi everybody. I'm Molly Morgan and I'm the Vice President of Student Government Association this year. And first I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you all about allocations funding, so I'm sure that's what most of you are probably going to be receiving throughout the year. Um, I just want to go ahead and give you our deadlines. Our preliminary allocations deadline this year is Monday, December 7th um, by 4.30 p.m. in our office. <coughs> this is not a mandatory deadline, but we do highly encourage it because a lot of organizations sometimes come across like problems in their budget or maybe some numbers aren't adding up right. So this is a chance for the committee to give you feedback on your request. Our final allocations deadline is Friday, February 5th, 2016 at 4.30 in the office. This is required if you are wishing to receive funding and we need it in hard copy and late applications will not be accepted. Um, at this time, you're also going to have an opportunity to sign up for a hearing. A hearing is mandatory and this is just a meeting with your organization and the committee. That way we can learn more about your request, learn more of like the details because there's only so much you can fit on an Excel budget. And the first reading of the bill is Thursday, March 3rd, 2016 at 7 in the Black and Gold Room. Again, this date is not mandatory. Um, you can show up if you would like to kind of talk to senators and stuff after and advocate for your organization. Um, however, the second reading is Thursday, March 10th at seven in the ballroom. And all organizations wishing to receive funding have to have at least one representative present at this meeting. You can send an officer or any member, but just make sure if you're going to send them that they are very knowledgeable of your budget and what exactly you're asking for because they may be called to like speak to the Senate on behalf of your request. And yeah, so that finishes up allocations. For appropriations, that is for any organization who doesn't receive allocations money, um, unless you are submitting an equipment request. But appropriations is dollar amounts of $1,000 or less. Um, you can use the money for an event, a trip, speaker, anything like that. Just as long as it's under $1,000, people usually use it towards lodging or mileage. Um, and then we also have individual requests through appropriations, which is if you're a grad student and say you've been doing research with one of your professors and you want to go present it at a conference, you are eligible to apply for up to $500 of funding to help you pay for your hotel, mileage, or whatever. And then equipment funding, like I said, is for any organization, even if you did get allocations. And that is dollar amounts up to $1,500. And after that, 1,500 SGA will match you dollar per dollar. So say like for your equipment you need 2,000, we'll give you the 1,500, then we'll match you that extra 500 dollar per dollar. But are there any questions at all? Do you need deadlines repeated or? No? All right, thank you guys, have a great day. Thanks, Molly. Yeah. So um, the, the sheet Molly was holding the, the deadlines and also the funding guide that explains the process in more detail, that's all available in the folder, the electronic folder that I'm gonna show you at the end of the meeting. So you'll be able to access those deadlines. Um, also, student government will probably do training sessions as that those things get closer so you can utilize them. But today was just to give you a, like a taste of what that process looks like. 
Okay, up next we've got um, Skylar from the Foundation to talk about I Fed the Tiger. Yeah, so I Fed the Tiger is an annual campaign that we have every year, and it's basically a matching gift campaign. So um, if you or maybe a parent or somebody gives $50 to, your, to your organization, right now I'm going out and finding sponsors who will match that $50, so $100 to your organization. So we request that all gifts are... Um, well, you can make whatever size of gift, obviously, as you want, but we'll match up to $100. So if you give a gift of $200, we'll match $100 of that. But if you give two gifts of $100, we can match all of that. So there is a little bit of a loophole, but basically it's a nice way for us to kind of spread that around. Um, the sponsorship dollars, those are fairly limited in that after they're out, they're just kind of out for your column. So as an example, last year it took 12 days for all of that sponsorship money for student organizations to be gone. And that meant over $9,000 went to student organizations between gifts and sponsorship matches, but 12 days is all that it lasted. So it's a nice way kind of for you guys to get double your money. Um, in order to make a gift, you can bring stuff into the foundation. We're located in the Robin Center, or you can go onto the foundation website. So that will become active on October 26th. That's when the I Fed the Tiger campaign starts. And so there will be an I Fed the Tiger place that you can go from the website. Um, and then if you don't know how to get to the foundation website, you should, but you can access it through the Fort Hayes website. So that's kind of the easy way. But again, you guys can come on over to the Robin Center too. So that would be one way to do it. So October 26th is when that again is scheduled to start um, and we have it for eight weeks so ending December 11th but um, I would be surprised if funding lasts that long last year we ended about two weeks early so you guys have any questions about any of that okay thank you thank you Thanks. so it's an easy way for your organization to double those donation dollars so tell your parents tell your friends grandma have a right to a check um, fundraising I just want to talk about a, a little bit in in general so your organization obviously there's these different ways you can get funding but your organization may choose to do some individual fundraising whether that's a bake sale or a car wash or partnering with the restaurant to get part of the profits for that day or whatever it might be and your group is allowed to do that but one thing that we do ask is for you to register those fundraisers with us uh, with the CSI four days before you do the project so you can find that form on TigerLink it's in the Center for Student Involvement's page and it just asks you like what kind of project it is, who you're working with. Um, we do that so that we can kind of help advise organizations and make sure people aren't uh, trying to do the same thing at the same time. And also that in case there's any additional steps that you need to take. So for example, you can do a bake sale here in the union, but because we have an agreement with Chartwells, there's a couple extra steps you have to take to bring in your own food. Um, you can do a raffle or a drawing, but because of Kansas state law, there's a couple extra steps that you have to make sure to make sure it's legal. So I'm here to help you, guide you through that process, and um, so that's why we have you register those fundraisers. So now that you've collected all of this money and have all this money for your organization, I've got Sandy here to, from the purchasing office to talk about like some resources for you managing that using student activity accounts and using six digit accounts from SGA. So. Hi, my name's Sandy. I work in administration and finance in um, Sheridan Hall 318. It's up on the third floor. Um, we're there to help you with your allocations. We can help you make your airfare, get your airfare tickets, plan your lodging, pay your registration with your allocations funds. Also, we are there to help you with your student activity accounts if you need help making deposits, doing uh, requests for credit card. We're there to help you with that. Um, some departments, some treasurers have IFAs to work in their office and they've been on campus to where they can do it themselves. And the basic PR, there's a link for it. The cash box, there's a link to go out and each of those links tells you how to fill out the IFAS form. If you have any questions, you can call our office. We can walk it through and help you with it, or you can just call us and we'll do it for you. Um, also, if you're having a meeting and you need the balance on your account, you can call us and we can give it to you over the phone, or we can do a PDF and send that information to you. Um, the one thing with the airlines we request that you come at least six weeks ahead of your trip, or there's times that uh, 
registrations could be limited. Get there as soon as you can to our office so we can get you registered and get you some hotels fill up quickly on conferences. We want you there and to help you fill out everything and get it done in time. If you have problems doing deposits, um, you can come to our office or you can go to Student Fiscal Services. Um, Oktoberfest, CSI is going to ask you if you want a cash box. They're just asking if you want a cash box. You still have to make a request for a cash box on the accounting system. Um, if you're having a problem with your getting your information on IFAS, your balances and that kind of stuff, you can contact the, our office and we can request that you get, as a PR submitter, you have access to the accounting system. And that is set up through Rachel Deppenbush. Um, if you do want IFAS training, you can come to our office. We'll give you the complete training as a user. Are there, oh, one other thing, if you are requesting a reimbursement, you must have an itemized receipt. The only time you don't need an itemized receipt is when you're making a payment to a charitable organization. And in that case, you need the minutes of your meeting where you designated you would give to that group. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. So this document, with all the helpful links, is going to be one of those documents that's in the folder so you can access that. Um, but the, the money stuff is, is one of the things that, that I don't know a whole lot about. And, so the, and some of your advisors may know about it. Some of you may actually have done some of the, the IFIS accounts. But if you don't know, Sandy and Kayleen over in the purchasing office can get you set up on those trainings and can help you through the process. So it's a lot to try to remember all that stuff that was up on the screen, but just know that, that Kay, uh, Kayleen and Sandy in the purchasing office can help you through, and their contact information is on that document. Okay, up next we're going to talk a little bit about service hours. You know, we've mentioned a couple times it's an expectation to do 20 hours of service every year. So we've got Haley from Tigers and Service who's going to talk a little bit about how you log those hours. Hi everybody, I'm Haley, like you said, I am the student coordinator of Tigers in Service. And um, again, like he said, you need 20 hours of service annually to be an organization. And so to log your hours in TigerLink, obviously you log in on your account and there will be service hours on your, under your involvement, which is under your name. You go to involvement and it'll have service hours on the screen. And you go over and you do add service hours. And then this page will pop up. And um, if you are a member of several organizations, when you click on this, um, all of your organizations are going to be in this box. And you choose the one that you want your service hours to go towards. And um, of course, give us the description of what you did and um, the date and how many hours it was. And um, the one thing that we're really stressing is the verification contact. This isn't your email address. It is, um, say you did work for a church, um, it would be probably the email address of the pastor or someone who can vouch for you and say that yes, they were there and that they did this. Um, also, with um, Tigers in Service, um, something to say, uh, if you guys have a big event and you are in need of volunteers, you can always contact us. Um, you can email us, call us. We're in Custer Hall, room 202. And um, we can help you find volunte volunteers for your event. We have a database in our computer of um, all the people who actually came to us and said, hey, we want to volunteer it on campus. So um, that's definitely a benefit. Um, I think that's all I have. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks. So as she mentioned, you can, you'll have to select the organization. One thing with uh, individual members, it's best if they go on and log their, their hours individually. So even if your organization did a group project, 
it's better to have everyone that show up go in and log that one hour individually because then they'll individually get credit for it. That's a better route than having your president go in and log 20 hours of service for 20 people that were there because then that president gets individually gets all credit for those 20 hours. So it's better to have them log it individually. And then as an individual, you're not allowed to double dip. So if I did one, hours of, one hour of service at a church, I have to pick an organization. I can't give that hour to my fraternity and to my honor society and to my residence hall. I have to pick one of those three to give it to. Um, we did want to make you aware of an opportunity to get some, to get some service and to, to be a charity sponsor for uh, Relay for Life. So this is something, the Relay for Life of Ellis County has been going on for several years, but this year for the first time it's going to be held on campus. It's going to be in Gross Memorial Coliseum, and this is something that President Martin has taken an interest in and has encouraged faculty and staff to select and create teams, but we also want to encourage student organizations to do it. So you can see the dates and times up there, uh, September 18th from 3 to 10. But what you can do is set up your team ahead of time. That way you can fundraise for Relay for Life. Um, and the best way to do that, you'll do it all through their website, not anything on TigerLink or on FHSU's website. But it's best to have one person go in and create the team first. So maybe your organization's president or if you have a service officer. And then after that team is created, then your other organization members can go in and join that team. So what that does is prevent four people from going in and signing up under the name of one organization and you've got four different teams. You want all those people in your organization linked together. Um, so that's a great opportunity to take advantage of. The very next slide is another opportunity on September 19th. So this is something that I planned before I knew about Relay for Life. So, uh, but the good news is you can still participate in both. There's just a slight overlap in time. Um, so it is possible to attend the leadership retreat and then go and join your team out at the Relay for Life. Um, but every fall, we try to offer some sort of leadership or personal development opportunity for the members of our student organizations. In the past, it's been a lot of different things, anything from goal setting to mission statements to recruitment. But this year, we're going in a little bit of a different direction, kind of focusing on personal development. And the topic is student debt. So we're going to have two people come in from the studentdebtcrisis.org. It's a nonprofit group that specializes in helping students um, navigate through the world of student loans and, and dealing with their student debt because um, you know I'm 30 years old and have a master's degree but I still kind of get confused about what the different repayment options are and the different plans and everything so this is a great opportunity for our students and it's applicable everywhere from your brand new freshman members because they're going to give advice on how to take out loans appropriately and and how to kind of make plans and what the best types of loans to take out all the way to your senior members who are getting ready to graduate and start repaying back those loans because they'll give advice on uh, repayment options and debt forgiveness options and, and all sorts of different things. So I think it's gonna be a really great retreat. There's no pre-registration required. Um, we'll provide refreshments throughout the day. You're gonna get a lot of information. It is a Saturday afternoon, but it's definitely worth coming and committing to those three hours because you're gonna get a lot of really useful, practical information out of this retreat. Um, we're co-sponsoring this year with the American Democracy Project, so they're over in Custer Hall. So the CSI has been working with the, those students to, to get this plan. So I think it's, I think it's gonna be a really excellent retreat and I encourage you all to attend and also to tell, tell your organization members to attend. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that you get to do as a student organization is participate in homecoming. So the, the options that are available to you is you can nominate people for homecoming royalty, so king and queen candidates. You can enter a banner in the banner contest, and those are displayed down here on the stairs coming down from the food area to Cody Commons. Um, and then we also select a winner and, and broadcast that on our social media outlets. You can have a booth at Oktoberfest, so that's a good fundraiser that a lot of our organizations take advantage of, selling something during Oktoberfest. And then finally, you can enter your organization in the homecoming parade. So whether you've got a semi and you wanna create a float, or you've got a truck, or you just wanna walk as an organization with a sign, um, your group can participate in the parade, get a little bit of vis visibility with the campus community and with the Hayes community, and uh, have an opportunity to win one of the prizes for best float entries. So if you're interested in doing any of those things, the forms are available, and the first deadline you need to, be, you need to know about is September 11th. So the Oktoberfest entry and the homecoming royalty entries are due by that first deadline of September 11th. You have a little bit extra time with the banner contest and the, with the parade because we don't have to have a lot of information ahead of time for those. Um, so those deadlines are, are later on in September. 
But if you want to do Oktoberfest and if you want to nominate people for royalty, you need to make sure you get those done by September 11th. Something new this year that we wanted to make sure you talk about is that the university is going through a new process of branding and trying to make our Tiger Head brand more well known. Um, I've heard from other people that President Martin's goal is to have the Tiger Head logo be as recognizable as the Jayhawk and as the Wildcat. So in order to do that, we obviously have to put it out there a lot more. So the text on the screen is a couple of snippets from a, a memo that went, came out from University Relations. But basically it says that we're really, we're really pushing um, a consistent brand. We're eliminating any secondary logos. So that includes student organization logos. So if your organization has a logo, um, we're removing that from things. And instead we're going to a standardized university logo that features your organization's name. So the example here is the American Institute of Graphic Arts, but all of our organizations that have existed in the past, this logo has been created for you. So it's got the Tiger Head, it's got Fort Hayes State University, and then it has your organization name underneath. So we want you to start including this on everything that you do. When you do posters, when you do um, flyers, if you're um, designing something, we want to have that logo be included um, and start getting rid of any other logos that you might have. The one exception is if your organization is affiliated with a national or international organization, you can continue to use those logos in addition to this. So for example, fraternities, they could have their fraternity crest on their poster, but then maybe along the bottom they have like a tagline that has the university logo and their phone number included. So we want to incorporate those national entities into our local branding. Um, as you're using the logos, you need to make sure you're getting approval from University Relations. So if you're designing a cup or a brochure or a t-shirt, make sure that you submit that to University Relations for approval. And with the tiger, they're wanting it to be used in its entirety. So in the past, maybe you've seen ones where it was just cut off and it was just the eyes, or maybe it was just half of the head. They're phasing out all of that stuff and they're going to use the tiger head in its entirety. So, Something new this year, um, we wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. And we're not going to start denying posters that don't have these logos yet, but six months or ten months from now, we'll probably get to that point where if it doesn't have the proper logo, it's not going to be able to be up on poster out and it's not going to get approved. As we wrap up today, I want to talk a little bit about services that are available to you as, as an organization. One is the Center for Student Involvement. So hopefully you've realized this is the Center for Student Involvement. There's probably better places that we could have this meeting because you know office work is still going on. But we wanted you to know that this is a space that's available for you to utilize. There are several areas that are um, hosted out of our office, and student organizations is one of those. So you can come down, you can use the space. Usually this is set up with tables. Um, you can use our workroom. So if you want to make posters or signs, we've got paper and markers and supplies in here. Um, if you give us a little bit of notice, we can even potentially order some supplies for you if there's something specific you're looking for. We also have a storage room uh, back in this other room, and so we can do temporary storage for you. So a good example is if you're tabling up by Starbucks for a week and you don't want to have to haul your stuff back and forth to an apartment or someone's house, you can con um, reserve temporary storage with us and you can just bring it downstairs and then take it back up every day during that week. If you're looking for more long-term storage, we do have a limited amount of space available and it's just first come, first serve. So if you're needing to store a box of supplies for the semester, uh, you can contact us and if we have space, we can let you do that. You can also make black and white copies here. So printing meeting agendas or minutes or black and white posters, you can do that here in our copier for free. Um, you can utilize our poster route, which is 40 locations across campus. So you bring in posters and we put them up all over campus for you. Um, and if you need help designing those posters or designing a t-shirt or a brochure, you can use our graphic designers. Um, if you want to turn in a request to our graphic designers, that is a little bit of a lengthy process. So they ask for three weeks before you need it. So that gives them enough time to uh, design something, get it back to you for, to look over, and then finalize the proof before they send it out. Uh, but that is a service that's available to you. Some of the other things that you can do that aren't aren't services provided by the CSI, but I want to let you know about them, is the union is available for you to reserve space. So if you want to reserve a meeting room or table or be out on the quad or the patio, even if you're going over to Beach Smith to use the stage, the union administrative office can, can set up those reservations for you. 
So Heather Rohr is the office manager. She would be the person to contact, and her phone number's up there, but she can get you set up with any, any room reservations in the union or out on the quad or Beach Smith. Another thing that students have a love-hate relationship with is the all-student email. So you probably hate getting them all, but you probably like being able to send those out to advertise your events. So if you want to um, have an all-student email sent out, that's done in the Student Affairs Office, and Rachel Brindley is the contact person for that. Um, whether you realize it or not, she tries to limit the amount of emails that you do get, and so if space is full, she'll, um, she won't accept any new all-student emails. So if you know you've got something coming up, send it to her a week or two in advance, and then that'll kind of make sure that you can get it out on the day that you want it out. Um, but you'll just, in the subject line, put all student email, and then in the body of the email, tell her what it is that you want to send out. I told you at the beginning of the meeting that we've gone paperless this year. So if you want to access all the resources, and I definitely encourage you to, um, from this meeting, if you go to TigerLink and go to the Center for Student Involvement's page, so you'll access that through the organizations and then Center for Student Involvement, in our documents folder, which you can see here, you can, we've got a whole folder of, of student organization meeting information. So you can access this PowerPoint presentation. We're going to have a video recording that we're doing today, so that'll be available on YouTube that you can share with um, other members of your organization that maybe need it. The deadlines for funding, the funding guide, the I fed the tiger information, all that stuff is going to be saved and accessible through TigerLink. So make sure that you are aware of that, make sure you're using that information and sharing it with the people that you need to share it with. So I told you I'd be good with your time, you know I did 40 minutes so I feel like that's pretty good. I get a little bit shorter every time I do this, but we've got a little bit of time for questions. So what, what questions do you all have still? Okay, if you don't have anything, I'll stay up here for a little bit if you want to have one-on-one -on -one questions. I also ask you, um, please finish that survey on the Campus Labs Respond app. Um, that lets me know that you understood what I hoped you understood, and it also gives you a chance to let me know what organization you're representing, so it's kind of an extra double check to make sure that we get all of our organizations represented, and a final question about what feedback you want to give. So if you wish I would have gone into more detail or something, or less detail, or more guest speakers, or whatever feedback you want to give, you can provide that through that app. So with that, that's all I've got for you. Thanks for coming today and have a great rest of your week.